Well, suffering hits us all, doesn't it? I haven't met anyone so far in my life who can say, well, I don't know what it means to suffer. I have never suffered. Well, maybe the pandemic or personal tragedy, suffering hits us all. In many ways, it comes in many shapes and sizes, doesn't it? It may be psychological, emotional, it may be physical. You may have uh, visible scars to show it, or invisible scars. But no one is immune to suffering. Uh, There's no vaccine against it that you can take. You can't be triple dosed against suffering. No, we all experience times when our world is crumbling down, when we are lost in the storms of our life, when disease, death, disaster, depression, disappointments surround us. Now, it can be different things for different people, isn't it? For you, it might be the loss of your dear parents, mum and dad. Or a loss of your spouse, the one you remember walking down the aisle with. Or a loss of a child whose smile you cannot ever forget. A loss of a friend, loss of that dream job, loss of relationships through conflict or sin. Loss of your own health. Suffering hits us all. And I'm conscious that uh, some of you sitting here listening uh, are going through intense suffering. And suffering raises uh, very uncomfortable questions for us, doesn't it? How can a good God allow evil? Why does God allow bad things to happen to good people? Why do I... Why am I suffering? Why do innocent people suffer? Why? Well, what does God have to say about that? About our suffering? Well, the book of Job answers some of these questions for us. And for the next few weeks, we'll be digging deep into this book. It's a painful book. It's a frustrating book at times. Especially frustrating if you're expecting neat and tidy answers. But this book is also very encouraging because it teaches us how to endure suffering faithfully. How can you and I cope with tragic circumstances as the Lord's people? Many sufferers throughout the ages have taken refuge in this book, the book of Job, and found profound comfort from God, and that's what we'll be doing in these next few weeks. Well, let's begin with our first chapter, first theme. Uh, The main character of our book is Job, there it is in verse 1, in the land of Uz, there lived a man whose name was Job. This book, book begins with an introduction. Introductions are very important, aren't they? Uh, Let me confess Uh, I am terrible at introductions. When I first meet uh, people, they introduce themselves to me, they tell me their name, and uh, one minute in the conversation, I've already forgotten their name and half of what they said to me. It's terrible, isn't it? Uh, But we are not, we ought not to do that with the book of Job, with Job, because this introduction sets the stage for the rest of the book. We're not to forget what Job is like. Verse 1, look with me again. This man was blameless and upright. He feared God and shunned evil. You see, first thing to note about Job is that he is a godly man, a man of integrity, a righteous man, a blameless man. He's so in tune with God that he makes just in case sacrifices. Do you see that in next words? Uh, when his children would hold uh, birthday parties, it says after that, 
Early in the morning, Job would sacrifice a burnt offering for each of them, thinking, perhaps my children have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. And this was Job's regular custom. He was a righteous man. But not only that, he was a very wealthy man. Uh, he has a lot of uh, assets, you know, livestock, cattle, sheep, and so on. In fact, it says uh, he was the greatest man among the people of the East. In terms of wealth, he was the Bill Gates, Elon Musk of the day. So he's a righteous man. He's a wealthy man. But that's just the background information, background notes before we get to the real scene. And the scene begins in verse 6. The cam camera angle shifts from earth to heaven. The curtain is lifted. We're taken to the inner courts of heaven, the engine room from where the world is run. And it says this, One day the angels came to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan also came with them. You see, God, the king, summons all his angels. And Satan takes along with them. And Satan, by the way, it's, a, it's not a name here. It's a title, you know, like the prime minister or the reverend. It's a title, Satan. Uh, and Satan here means the accuser. The one who accuses, the one who brings charges. And that's what Satan does, doesn't it? He, he roams around the world looking for people to bring down, to condemn, to accuse before God. So verse 8, uh, God says to uh, Satan, you, don't, you, won't, you, know, you won't get away with Job, he says. Verse 8, have you considered my servant Job? There is no one on earth like him. He's blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. Now we heard it in the beginning of the book, and now we hear it again from the lips of God. Job is a righteous man. He's a blameless man. He's a man of integrity, and he is innocent. But Satan won't have that. Satan isn't persuaded. Uh, he isn't convinced. So he says to God, God, you must be joking. Take your rose-tinted glasses off, God. He says, does Job fear God for nothing? Have you not put a hedge around him and his household and everything he has? You have blessed the works of his hands, so that his flocks and herds are spread throughout the land. Satan says to God, let me break it to you, God. Job is just a gold digger. You know what a gold digger is? Let me tell you. A person who forms relationships with others purely to extract money or blessings from them. God, Job doesn't really love you. He loves the things you have given him. He's only following you because he sees the benefit of earthly blessing for you. He's in it for what he can get out of it. And look, you know, Satan has got a point. Uh, have you ever had someone uh, be very friendly to you, uh, but when they find out that you're not going to do what they want you to do, they are gone? Have you had that? And there are so many people who only follow God because they want his stuff, his good gifts. You know, he has given me a good job, a good wife, a good health, done a miracle or two for me. But the moment that good blessing is taken away, the moment God doesn't serve their needs, they stop following God. And the question is, as one writer puts it, is God so good that he can be loved for himself, not just for gifts? Can a man hold on to God when there are no benefits attached? 
I wonder how would you answer this question? So Satan thinks that Job is a gold digger believer. So Satan says to God, verse 11, But now stretch out your hand and strike everything he has, and I will tell you, God, he will surely curse you to your face. We'll see about his devotion then, says Satan. And God allows him to do that. Uh, verse 12, uh, the Lord said to Satan, very well. Everything he has is in your power, but on the man himself, do not lay a finger. Now we zoomed out from heaven to earth, and we see what trauma, what devastation, what horror Satan brings to Job. See, the day began very normally. You know, kids have gathered together at the older brother's house, maybe celebrating a birthday party. The livestock is well and sound. Everything seems to be so quiet and peaceful. But maybe that's just quiet before the storm. Job is at home when he hears someone knocking. Maybe it's, uh, it's the postie. But no, it's a familiar face. A farmhand who's a... Uh, uh, face gives it away that something is terribly wrong and he tells job terrible news the oxen were plowing and donkeys were grazing nearby and the sabaeans attacked and made off with them they put their servants to the sword and i'm the only one who escaped to tell you now before this devastating message has time to sink in there's another knock on the door Another messenger. The fire of God fell from the heavens and burned up the sheep and servants. I'm the only one who has escaped to tell you. Then another knock. The Chaldeans formed three raiding parties and swept down on your camels and made off with them. Blow after blow, isn't it? Blow after blow. But greatest blow of all, Final knock at his door. Your sons and daughters. Your sons and daughters were feasting and drinking wine at the oldest brother's house when suddenly a mighty wind swept in from the desert and struck the four corners of the house and collapsed on them and they are dead. Job loses everything and everyone he cares about in a day you know i know that some of you know how this feels to have one blow after another the trail of suffering to have one suffering after another and it'll be so tempting wouldn't it uh, to throw your fist at god and say god what are you doing So tempting to abandon your trust in God, say, I don't know if I can trust you, God. I don't know if I can trust you anymore. But you see how Job responds to this stacked disaster. Verse 20, Job got up, tore his robe, and shaved his head. That's a symbol of a great grief and sorrow. He cried and wept. Then he fell to the ground in what? In worship. He responds by worshipping. He says this, Naked I came from my mother's womb, naked I will depart. The Lord gave, the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord You know, it's, it's shocking. Job, your sons and daughters lay dead. All your money gone, yet you are praising the name of the Lord. Why, Job? You see, because he has 
no doubt that God is still in control. He knows that God is still good. Job, Job praised God when he showered gifts upon him, and he says, I'm going to, still going to praise him now that he has taken those gifts away. I wonder, how do you typically respond when you face tragedy or loss? How do you respond? Do you fall down in praise? I don't, and I know it. This is a challenge, isn't it? Well, chapter 2, the scene shifts, and we are in heaven again. And God says to Satan, uh, look at Job, I told you he's still the same after all the horrors you've thrown at him. And said to Satan, uh, uh, you know, as cynical as ever, he's like, ah, it's only because you didn't let me go far enough, God. So Satan says to God, but now stretch out your hand and strike his flesh and bones, and he will surely curse you to your face. And the Lord says very well. Uh, we're back on earth, and uh, verse 7, horrors continue. Job is now afflicted with terrible skin diseases. There are sores from head to toe. He ends up among the ashes, you know, that is a, a rubbish tip outside the city walls. Uh, his people, probably his own people, uh, thrown him outside the city because they don't want to be contaminated by him physically or spiritually because, you know, the man who is treated like this by God must be a terrible sinner, they think. And uh, we don't want to do anything with him. So there he is, uh, near the rubbish dump, just scraping himself uh, with bro broken pottery. And his wife comes in and says the obvious, are you still maintaining your integrity? Curse God and die. But Job still keeps the faith and he responds. He says, shall we accept good from God and not trouble? Remember, we trusted him when he showers us with good gifts. I will trust him when he is giving me bad things. You know, whenever I read the story of Job, I pray to God, God, please give me the enduring faith of Job. But he wasn't perfect, of course, and uh, he has his ups and downs, and we will discover that in the rest of the book. But let me ask, what can we learn from this story so far? Well, there are many things, but let me point to just one. You know, when it comes to suffering, you and I, we give neat and tidy answers, very simplistic solutions, you know. And this story teaches us that suffering is not so simple. You know, when someone is suffering, uh, we say, don't we, well, you reap what you sow. If you live a good life, God will bless you. If you do bad things, God will punish you. So if you're suffering, it must be because God is judging you for sin. And if you're someone who is suffering severely, if someone, your marriage has failed, your finances have a broken apart, your kids are wandering off. Maybe you are a sinner. Maybe you are a great sinner. That's why it's happening to you. So God is cursing you and punishing you. And we often ask ourselves uh, when things go wrong, you know, why is God punishing me? What am I doing wrong? Maybe I need to go to church for more, pray more, read the Bible more, give more. If After all, if I uh, live a good life, God will bless me, right? Not right. Three times in our story, three times, uh, we read that in all this, Job didn't sin. Job was righteous. 
upright, blameless. And God knows he's righteous. Satan knows he's righteous. But still he suffers horribly. What this means for us is that our suffering is not necessarily because God is judging us. Or we are under God's curse. Next time you see someone suffer horribly, don't say it in your heart that, oh, they must be great sinners. It's not as simple as that. Don't say in your heart, oh, God must hate me because I'm going through this tough time. No. Like Job, we need to endure suffering in faith. We need to trust God's character that he is in control even when I am falling apart. And say, the Lord gives. The Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Now maybe you are in a tough spot today and you can't feel or see the love of God. You need proof that God loves you. Well, for that, we need to look to the true Job, better Job, who came 2,000 years ago. He too suffered greatly. He too was driven by his uh, own people outside the city gates. He was naked. He too was forsaken by everyone. Jesus Christ, the sinless one, God in flesh, who deserved no suffering, but he endured willingly for our sake. He didn't do, need to do any of that, but he did it because he wanted to show us his love, to take our punishment upon himself, to show us that he knows what it means to suffer. He came to take our curse away, to take away our punishment on himself, and to make us children of God who are belovedly loved. So when you suffer, my brothers and sisters, if you're going through tough times, don't say God hates you. He does not. He loves you. And he has given Christ to prove that to you. You know, one thing that I find very interesting about the book of Job is that uh, Job never finds out why he suffered. Read the whole book. He never finds out why he suffered. And I think that's uh, instructional for us. What the Bible calls you and me, my brothers and sisters, what Bible calls you and me to do is to serve God even though you will never know, just like Job never knew, the actual reason for your suffering. The question is, can you worship him and not know why you suffer? Can you trust in him while you are suffering? Can you entrust yourself to him and not know the answers? Let's pray.